Hi everyone, this is Shalendra and today we are going to talk about market mix modeling and to discuss more in details about market mix modeling I've got with me Satya, Satya who is a uh, industry thought leader in the MarTech space. So Satya, how are you doing? I'm very well, Shalini. Thank you very much. It's good always to have a chat with you. Good stuff. So Satya, today we'll talk about MMM as it is called or market mix modeling. So tell us, what does market mix modeling mean for a marketer? Great question, Shalinda. I guess marketers really need to understand what MMM is all about. So effectively, in a very, very plain, simple English language, you know, CMOs or marketing leaders have had a challenge of measuring the effectiveness of marketing programs that they're doing, especially in the above the line world. When we had data-driven marketing and digital coming through, we've had the ability to attribute and attribution modeling coming in. So you're able to very quickly quantify your revenue returns based on the investment that you're making. What market with modeling has done is actually a statistical approach and looking at differentiated data set at a very, very granular level and actually pinpointing as to what exactly are the different variables that attribute to the sales or revenue realizations for an organization. So that in a very, very simple language, would, what, would, what was called is market mix modeling. So that gives you um, a better idea to where to invest your next dollar because you put a, a, a dollar value on each of the marketing activity that you perform. Absolutely. So let's take another example. So let's say as a, as a marketer, if I'm running a campaign for this month, and I only had Facebook ad, and let's assume that I got about 15% incremental sales, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that Facebook ad basically generated 15% sales. Next month I did a Google ad campaign, and that basically resulted in a 20% sale. So it's an abstract way of saying, okay, looks like Facebook ad and Google ad, Google ad performed better because we percent But in the third month, if you did a combination of Facebook ad and Google ad, and you had an incremental sale of 15%, how do you attribute what percentage was because of Facebook and what percentage was because of, of Google ads? And that's where market mix modeling starts coming in because you've got the granularity of data that you've got in there and you're able to differentiate at different levels and then what you're looking at the base variables and incremental variables that really look at the incrementality of the sale to define it as well so your base variables would be predominantly anything to do with seasonality the brand value the loyalty so if a customer is loyal to your brand they're basically going to buy that product whether you like it or you don't like it or whatever offers are there in there but if you start doing some specific offers, promotions, coupons, discounts, that's where your incrementality starts to measure in. So that's where you look at your base variables and your incremental variables and you start defining it and you're playing with it. And as the word says, market mix modeling, it's all about the four P's of marketing that you had. So what are the levers in the four P's that you start playing with to get that increment, in, incrementality out? No, that, that's, that's very well explained. And that also leads to something called path to purchase because People don't buy just because they've seen, seen one ad, right? It might be a combination of five or, five or six different ads that they've seen yes. over a period of time, which they then take it and say, well, fine, I have now decided uh, to buy, buy something. For example, if someone wanted to buy a camera, um, good old story, um, then they may look at an ad while uh, driving uh, on, an, on, a, on a hoarding. Then secondly, they would have seen a magazine ad and then they would go in and do a review, watch a review on YouTube and then make a decision that they want to buy. But if you, and all they see is, what you see as a marketer is a click that you've done on a Facebook or a Google ad. But there is a lot of other, other, uh, variables, other that variables that you actually miss on because you're attributing 100% to that particular campaign that you've run, but actually it is not. I think that you made a good point, you know, and it's always good to chat with you because you bring all those live examples from the old school to the new school. So, you know, that, that concept of the hoarding. So I think that was started with the myth, you know, if you have, you would have seen that hoardings were pretty much the same ad were placed in incremental distances of say 50 meters or 100 meters, nothing changes. So it was more about the number of impressions that you get. It has a, your brand retention actually goes on. But does that, how do you attribute that? That hoarding being placed five times on a space, space of 500 meters as compared to other, were there any other variables that, that quantify that? It's not about, you know, you're not looking at one, two or three. You could be looking at hundreds of variables and it could, it, it could and not be surprised, it could be thousands of variables. That's why you say it's, it's a statistical method of aggregating data at a granular level and, and that granularity of data could be at, you know, at the NS level. So you, you start looking at it. and then you start comparing that when you have that granularity of data as to what variable really caused that spike and what was the incrementality that basically provided and, and, and move on from there. Good stuff. 
And that gives me a class example. One of the projects we ran, we were running through around about 12,000 different models that we ran through in order to get um, the uh, the output. And also, and how many variables? I think it was around about 56, 60,000 variables because of the lag that you needed to create to see the impact over a period of time. So what happens is that you see an ad that stays in your mind. For how long will that stay in your mind before it gets refreshed? Yeah. So you need to see the lag between the time um, time you saw the ad for the first time to, to the time you see second time before it hits and allows you to make a purchase. That also brings another question around the law of diminishing return. That also uh, it also means that if you start spending more and more in marketing, it doesn't mean that you know you'll start getting yeah. more and more sales. You know, so yeah. so 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 what what I uh, talk to people about is the response curves that you need to create for each and every channel or each and every campaign to see how much more can you invest in that particular campaign and that's where we calculate something called uh, average return on investment which is what you've seen in the past which then defines the marginal return on investment which is how much should be spent in the future in order to get a return yeah. and, or uh, if it is just tapering out if it is tapering out then no matter how much money you put on in it's not going to give you more return. So I think that also works a lot in our favor when you're doing market mix modeling uh, and getting that attributes. Yeah. One of the other challenges that you've got with market mix modeling is because you have all those variables, you churn those variables, by the time you come out to the, with a result and you want to basically change the model for incrementality and change, a lot of things have lapsed because what the whole idea about MMM is all about what happened in the past, what learnings I get from the past, and how can I can in introduce them in the future to influence my future sales and revenue. So that's where the agility in, in, and adaptability of MMM really comes very handy. So how do you you know, conceive the model, get your data, aggregate it, do, optimize, learn it, deploy it, and optimize it for learning. Good stuff. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Always, Always as. Good stuff. Thank you.